Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Look with me to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And uh, you're very familiar with the most familiar of the Psalms in Psalm 23. We've been looking at it for a number of weeks. I've got about uh, three more to go, two or three more to go. I'll finish up on the 13th, so I guess that's a couple of more. And uh, I'm really looking forward. I hope you won't miss these next two, uh, especially the last one on heaven. Uh, you don't want to miss that message. And we'll have a good time in the Lord on both those Sundays. So come expecting God to do some uh, wonderful things in these next couple of weeks. You know, COVID-19 has done a major thrust in anxiety, depression, suicides, domestic violence is uh, all-time high, placing uh, not only families in jeopardy, but also uh, our police. And uh, frankly, we've seen the effect that it's had uh, on our teachers and our students. People today are scared. And uh, frankly, the scare tactics that are uh, being propagated across this country has uh, really greatly contributed, that and the media have greatly uh, contributed to the rise in all of these issues. Uh, it's a tough day. It really is. And you've got a, really a couple of ways that you can respond to the COVID-19 and a couple of ways really you can respond to life itself. Uh, you could be overwhelmed and uh, overcome, or you can overflow. Uh, really, the choice is yours. Uh, the decision is yours in how you want to face uh, these troubling times. Uh, I know that Satan oftentimes uses fear uh, as a motivating factor in controlling people. And uh, frankly, it is working very effectively and very well and has in, having a very detrimental effect on a lot of people. And there are two ways that you can live. You can live uh, being overwhelmed by all of that or you can live in the overflow of what God wants to do uh, in your heart and in your life. And, and I'm choosing today to let you know that God is more than adequate to meet every need that you will ever face in all of your life. He's more than enough. Uh, I like uh, a passage in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 4 to be exact, and a powerful word in there. You can go home and study it and read it. Uh, there was a huge famine uh, that was in the land, and uh, people were starving to death. And some people brought some food and gave it to Elisha. And uh, Elisha calls his servant in and says, here, I want you to do this food. I, I want you to take the food and I want you to feed the people with it. And, and, and the servant said, wait a minute, are you nuts? Uh, th this is just a few morsels of food. And how in the world do you expect to feed all of these people? Well, that can't be done. And Elisha says, listen, I'm trusting God and what God said. And I want you to trust me and do what I tell you to do. And so the servant takes those few morsels of food calls the people and he feeds them. And the Bible says that everybody was filled to overflowing and they had food left over. Why? Because they were obedient to God. They did it God's way. They did what God told them to do, how God told them to do it. And there was more than enough to meet every one of those needs. So you can live your life being overwhelmed or you can live your life by faith and where God is, I assure you, you will have more than you will ever need. Now, the text this morning is found in verse number five. We won't take time to read all of it, but let me just start in verse five. Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. And here's my text today. My cup runs over. 
my cup is overflowing. One translation said it this way. You give me more than I can hold. I like that, don't you? Uh, so it starts out in the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, and because of that, I am uh, going to have everything that I will ever need. And then in verse 5, he builds on that and says, not only is the Lord to meet every need in my life, my cup overflows. Now, what's David talking about here when he's referring to the cup? He's talking about his life. He's talking about how that God is more than enough for every need in his life to the point that he's living in an overflowing situation. Uh, matter of fact, it's kind of like that artesian well that is on the inside of him. And, and it's just springing up and overflowing. Uh, the Gospel of John in the seventh chapter uh, the Bible says on the last and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and he said with a loud voice, now I want you to hear what he said. Listen to this. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Now the word believe there is the word pistuo. Uh, and it means to rely on, to depend on, to trust in, to have confidence in. And so Jesus said, if you will just trust me, rely on me, depend on me, have faith in me, you will live an overflowing life. I, I love it when somebody comes to me and they say, you know, pastor, uh, pray for me. I just lost my job. Now, I know they're a believer. I know Jesus lives his life in them. And, and so my response to them is this. Well, brother, don't worry about it. Uh, that faucet may have turned off, but because of Jesus living in you, God's just going to turn another faucet on and it'll overflow out of your life. That's living that abundant and overflowing lifestyle. Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 17, the Bible says, this is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, and he begins to quote, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in all the ways that you should go. If only, listen to this, if only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river. Your well-being like the waves of the sea. And he's just saying, if you had just listened to what I told you and had done what I had asked you to do, you would be in the predicament that you're in right now, but you'd be in an overflowing life. You would have more than you would ever need. But people don't listen to what God says and they choose rather than to live life God's way, they choose to live life their own way, thinking that they know more than God does about what is best for them, choose their own way, wind up in a mess, and God says, dummy, if you just listen, I'm not out to hurt you. I'm out to help you. I want you to have this abundant, overflowing life. And so if you just listen to my commands, you wouldn't be in the mess that you're in today. Now, let's do a little bit of practical thinking for just a minute. Money is a good thing. Now, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. It didn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of the money. So money inherently is not a bad thing. It is a good thing as long as you are managing it like God says to manage your money. God gave us the beauty of sex. Sex is a wonderful thing. As long as it is enjoyed in the confines of how God says that we are to enjoy it. Our body is a good thing, but God says, you know, there are certain things about your body that you need to be aware of and to take care of it, and you can have this overflowing life. God says and has a way that we're to do life. And when we choose to do it our way, what happens is, is that we literally get to the place 
that we doubt the goodness of God and his goodness for us. I'm going to ask you a question. And you don't need to raise your hands. But how many of you would love to live an overflowing life? How many of you would love that, that river of life flowing through you, overflowing out of your life? Every day of your life. Wouldn't you enjoy it? Well, there are certain things, and I'm going to give you four of them this morning. There are four things that you can do, I believe, that God's Word teaches, and there's probably more, but I will give you these four. Hope you'll write them down. They all start with an R, which will help you to remember it a little bit easier. The first thing is this. It's remaining close to Jesus every day. Remaining close to Jesus every day. I'll never forget uh, a number of years ago, somewhere in the neighborhood right now, about 35 years ago, uh, I went to White Oak Conference Center down in South Carolina and uh, attended a Master Life workshop. It was a discipleship time. And uh, one of the things uh, that they taught me was John 15, 5. And what did it ever just burn in my heart? And Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. So what he said there is that if you are connected to me, uh, if you are hooked up to me, then you're going to have this overflowing life, this connected life. Uh, but it's very important that the branch stay connected to the vine. You take that branch away from the vine, that branch is going to die and never bear fruit. Boy, Thursday was a great day, wasn't it? I don't know how many of you got to eat your turkey, but uh, boy, I got up really early Thursday morning and uh, went to the refrigerator and took that big old pot of turkey out. I've been soaking in the brine for 24 hours and uh, I dried it off and prepared it and I took it out to the Traeger and and put it on the grill, and about four and a half hours later, wow, one of the most succulent turkeys that anybody could ever want. Now, what would have happened if that Traeger had not been connected up to the power source? It would have been a mess at dinner time, wouldn't it? We'd have had a rare, raw bird to have to deal with. There wouldn't have been much... I'd have, I'd have caught it from the rest of the family, if you want to see it. I, I would not have been a fruit-bearing preacher on that particular day. Just wouldn't have been good. But when the Traeger was up to the power source and it was 350 degrees, in about four hours, that bird was just like it was supposed to be. And that's the way it is with us. As long as we are connected to the power source, then we're going to be fruit bearers and our life will be overflowing and you have to stay connected. Now, why is that so important? Well, if you want a relationship with somebody, you've got to spend time with them. You, you wouldn't have much of a marriage if you didn't spend time together as a husband and wife. You wouldn't be much parents if you didn't spend time with your kids. You wouldn't have much of a relationship with your kids if you didn't and Kids, you wouldn't have much of a relationship with your parents if you didn't spend time with each other. It requires that. It, it requires that you get up in the mornings and you spend time in the Word of God and you let God speak into your life and you pick out that which God has spoken to you. And it's not just a 10-minute deal or a 15-minute deal. I, I, I found that doesn't work very good for me that I have to take whatever it is that God has given me in that morning time with him, and I have to think about it, and I have to marinate it, and I have to meditate on it. And by the way, meditation is not a bad word. When we're talking about meditating on the word of God, uh, we're talking about just chewing on it and letting God deal with us all through the day that which he has poured into us in that morning. Now listen to what God's word says in John 15, 7. He says, if my words abide in you, that, that's hearing from God in that morning. It, it's, it's breathing in what God has to say to you in that morning time. Then he says this. He says, ask. 
That's prayer time. That's after you've heard from God, then ask. Go, go, go in prayer to God. Now watch what he says. Ask what you will and it will be done unto you. So you've got the prayer time and now you've got the promise. He said, let my word abide in you and ask. And here's the promise that goes with it. Verse 11 says, stay connected. Now watch this. And my joy will remain in you. Oh, I love this next part. And that your joy might overflow. Isn't that a great promise? So he just simply said, pray, read the word, think about it, abide in the word of God. Let the word of God abide, meditate, think about it, marinate it, ask, and you'll receive. I, I, I told you a little bit ago about how that fear will cause you to be overwhelmed and faith will cause you to live overflowing. One of them will bring you down and the other will lift you up. And there's a reason why many of you are not getting any answers to your prayer is because you're not abiding in the word. You're not asking for God to do what he says he's going to do. So you stay connected to Christ. Number two, uh, it, it, it gets tougher now as we go along. Okay, uh, as my granddaddy used to say, I'm going to start plowing close to the corn here this morning. So number two is refuse to be a griper and a complainer. If you want to have an overflowing life, Philippians 2.14 says, do everything. It didn't say, say do some things or part of the time, but do everything without grumbling and Complaining. First Thessalonians 5.18, powerful Thanksgiving weekend verse. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now watch this. For this is the will of God concerning you. Come back to that in a minute. Do you, do you know, uh, Adam, that it's a scientific fact uh, that when you live a thankful lifestyle instead of griping, moaning, and groaning, and complaining... Do you know that your brain then releases endorphins into your system that causes you to be smarter? It causes you to be more thankful? Do you know that's a scientific fact? They've isolated what those chemicals are, have put a name to them, and have proven through time that a thankful person lives longer than somebody who's not so thankful. So if being thankful makes you more healthy, smarter, happier, then the antithesis of that, I almost said it right, the opposite of that is that you're a griper and a complainer, then it, it's an unhealthy life that you live. So, so just let me, quit focusing in on the dumb mask that you're having to wear and start focusing in on the fact that God's giving you some pretty good air to breathe. Now, I'm trying to be nice, y'all. I really am. I doubt very seriously if I'll ever be politically correct. But I am going to be Christian. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, let, let me just ask you this. Has complaining ever made life better for you? Has complaining ever changed anything for you? I heard this morning before I came to church that uh, sometime Wednesday or Thursday, it's going to get down to like 25 degrees, 23 degrees, something like that. Inevitably, I mean, we've been enjoying this beautiful 70 degree fall weather, unbelievably. But somebody's going, oh, now I just don't like the cold weather. But does that help? Does that change anything? Has it ever made life better for you? Then if griping and moaning and complaining about stuff doesn't help anything, then it's a colossal foolish thing to do. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? Then if it doesn't make you feel better, then just quit complaining. Quit griping. Listen to what Colossians 2 says. 
rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Powerful words. I, I, all of the time somebody's coming up to me and they're, preacher, just pray for me. I want to know what the will of God is. I want to know what the will of God is. I, I need to know what the will of God is. And I just want to say, well, there's some things that you already know. You already know that the Bible says that this is the will of God concerning you. That you are thankful in every situation and every circumstance. So there is step number one. You know that you're to be thankful. You know that you're not to gripe, moan, and complain about stuff. But to be thankful in all things. God's not going to give you step two until you do step one. So quit griping and complaining and learn to be thankful. Number three. Resist the temptation to compare yourself with other people. Learn to be content. 2 Corinthians 10 says, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. Did God make you somebody that you're not? He did not make you someone else. He made you. And if you're not going to be you, who are you going to be? We, we, we don't need two of anybody else. I, I believe right now, uh, the top indoor sport in this country is really uh, comparing ourselves with somebody else. And unfortunately, the social media has propagated that more than anything that I've ever seen in my life. And we want to post these pictures, these picture-perfect pictures of where we are on vacation. And we're just going to brag, look where I am. And you're thinking, wow, look at that. I'd like to be like them. I'd like to be where they are. Or we take these selfies of this new outfit that we just bought. Oh, look where I've been. I, I, I've, I've been to Nordstrom's today and, and look at these new jeans. Now, aren't the holes just in the right place in my jeans? <laughs> we, we go further than that. Eh? We, we, we've gotten so silly about this comparative stuff Look at my neighbor's lawn. It is so green. I, I, I've, got to, I've got to get true green or something. I've got to get somebody to get these weeds out. Look at their yard. I wish my yard looked like their yard. I wish my yard man could do like their yard man does. Dumbest stuff in the world. And all of that does is just build up stress that leads to being overwhelmed instead of overflowing. Why does God say it's a foolish thing for us to? To be in a comparative lifestyle. Why does God say? Because ladies and gentlemen, somebody is somewhere is always going to be smarter than you. Somebody somewhere is always going to be prettier than you. S somebody somewhere is always going to have a better job than you. Somebody somewhere is going to live in a nicer house than you. Somebody somewhere is going to have it made better and be more cool than you. And because of that, you're going to be discouraged. And that discouragement leads to being overwhelmed instead of living overflowing. And the Bible simply says, don't do that. But be content. Some of you, I'm not advocating that you completely get off social media. But I think some of you really need to fast social media. So you could break the addictions that have really bound you up with it and get into this. Listen to what the word says. For who makes you different than anybody else? Well, what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you didn't receive it, why do you boast? L listen, everything you have came from God. You received it or you wouldn't have it. How many of you want to live longer? Here, here's what the wisdom writer said in Proverbs 14, 30. A heart at peace, one that is content, gives life to the body. But envy rots the bones. 
when you're looking and comparing somebody's house or car or job or money or lawn or all of that stuff out there, that envy, the Bible says, is like a cancer that rots your bones. You say, how do I, how do I, how do I deal with that? Do you know that resentfulness is learned? Jealousy is learned. Envy is learned. And anything that was learned can be unlearned. And the way that you learn to be unlearned in the area of envy is that you learn to be content. Paul said, I've learned in, the, in whatever state I am there with to be content. It's a learned experience. And when you learn to get your eyes off of people and what people have and stay focused in on the Lord and developing that relationship to him and learning to be blessed with what God has already blessed you with, then you'll cease to be envious. All right, let me give you number four. Reject being greedy and become generous. Paul read something. I, I didn't say this at nine o'clock and it just occurred to me. I, I read it somewhere this week. I don't remember where, but um, <clears throat> happiness is not born from generosity. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> I said that wrong. Generosity is not born from happiness. Happiness is born from generosity. We, we get the cart before the horse sometimes in our life. You understand that Learning to be generous uh, instead of being greedy and selfish and miserly, it's so important in our life. And, and it's important you hear what I'm about to tell you. I'm not just talking today about money. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about energy. I'm talking about compliments. I'm, I'm just talking about being an overall generous person with what God has entrusted you. When you get to the point that you get stingy and miserly, you get to the point that you're avarice. What you're really saying is, is that God, I really don't trust you. And, and God, I'm, I, I know that your goodness toward me is great, but, but I'm a, I have to hold on to this stuff because I'm afraid when it's all said and done, there won't be enough left for me. My, my wife and I, just, it's not boasting, it's just a fact. I got saved on April 12, 1970, on a Sunday morning. The next Sunday, we started tithing. Next Sunday, just born something. When, when Jesus took up residence, it's just something that he, he brought with him. That, 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 was, that, that was part of being obedient and walking with him. And, and I can tell you, 19, that's 50 years ago. And as best as I can tell you right now, it's never been a week that we ever robbed God of what right, rightfully belonged to him. And I, I, I'm telling you, generosity is a beautiful gift from God. And you need to learn to be generous instead of sin. It's a universal law that when you send it out, God's going to give it back. When, I, when we were uh, growing up over in the mountains, we had a corn crib. And we'd, we'd raise corn and, and we'd gather it up and harvest it and we'd put it in that crib. And we'd use it to feed the animals and we'd use it to grind cornmeal and, and, and we'd use it to plant for the next year. And, and boy, I'll tell you about planting season, that corn crib would get down pretty low. And, and we'd go over there and the tendency would be, well, you know what? Yeah, I, don't, I don't want to take too much of this out of here because we still got a long way to go. We got to get all the way to almost August before this stuff comes in. And, and I don't know where we're going to have enough. To... But we planted that field. We didn't just plant a few seeds holding on to the... We planted a field because there was a law, a universal law, that you, you, put, you put a kernel of that corn in the ground and it's going to grow up to be a stalk. And on that stalk is going to be several ears of corn that's going to be a whole lot more than what you put in the ground. Listen to how God says it. And this was taught here for many years. Listen to this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously 
will reap generously. Each of you, now uh, pay attention to this part. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Do you know, you know what that means? That means while you're sitting out here hearing a message or part of a message on generosity, don't get generous because you are feeling guilty because of what the preacher said and he's putting pressure on you to become generous. It won't work that way. God doesn't work that way. That's not what God wants. It's not what I want. L listen why. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, not, not under guilt because some preacher's putting you under guilt. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God's able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound into every good work. He's more than enough. My cup runs over, David said. I'm living this overflowing life. And the result of this is the generosity that I give it out and God gives it back so that I can give more. You ever wonder why you don't have enough? You ever thought about why you don't have enough? Israel was in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. God comes on and he says, hey, Israel, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to get you out from under this slavery. Here's the condition. First thing you do when you get back home is that you rebuild the temple. It's a disgrace. It's a dishonor. First thing you do when you get back home, you better rebuild it so you set them free. Well, they get back home, they don't do what he said. They started using, he said, take what you have, you take everything with you and use it, but they took it and used it for their own greedy, selfish purposes. There's a whole book in the Bible written about the experience. It's the book of Haggai. Now, I want you to listen what God did and how he responded to their disobedience. Listen to this. You have planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Can you see that? This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring down the timber, build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, listen, listen, Therefore, because of your disobedience, or because you didn't do what I told you to do, therefore, because you did it your way rather than my way, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I dare say we could go around with a microphone in this congregation today and those of you that are watching by live stream and television and ask you the question, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save your soul? And the answer would be yes, 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 yes. But do you trust him for anything else? You trust him to keep you from going to hell and to get you into heaven. But what about life itself? Luke 6 says, given it shall be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over my cup will be poured into your lap for the measure you use. It will be measured to you. Matthew 9 says, according to your faith, let it be to you. How you doing? <laughs> How connected are you to Jesus? How about your attitude? Are you griping and complaining? Mm. 
How generous are you? Would you stand with me and let's pray together for a minute? Father, in the name of Jesus, we approach you now in trust and in faith. Lord, I want to thank you that you are more than enough for our every need. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. Lord, I just pray for us as we stand before you in your presence right now. I pray, God, that, uh, Lord, if our day doesn't start out with you, if our day doesn't include some time uh, when we study your word and, and Lord, we meditate on that word during the day. God, help us to get there. Help our level of commitment right now be so free and open and receptive to you that, God, we would not be able to wait until we got into your presence. God, I pray for us in our attitude. I, I pray, God, that we would learn to be more thankful than we've ever been before. Help us not to get so focused in on what we don't have that we fail to see what you have given us. And Lord, you didn't call us to be somebody else. Lord, I remember when I first started preaching, I wanted to be like this preacher and I wanted to be like that preacher. And I, I, I gave time to developing traits to be like them and God I thank you that you set me free from that because you didn't call me to preach like somebody else you called me to be me God I thank you for reminding me every day that without you I can't do anything thank you for reminding me every day that everything that I have I have received from you and Lord help me to be a channel to bless other people with what you've blessed me with. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.